Uh, good morning. Today we will be doing 200 MCQs about orthodontics. Uh, the first question is the rectangular wire used in edgewise appliance is primarily meant for? The answer is correction of crown and root position. Now usually when you put a rectangular wire, it sits in the slot in such a way that it angulates the crown and the root position to the final position that is supposed to be in the arch. Uh, the second question is the buckle coil spring is used to regain the space between the first premolar and the first molar and what is the most common complication occurring post treatment? The answer is the rotation of the first premolar. Now usually this happens because since the premolar is slightly smaller and the roots are a little more slender than the molar and the molar is able to take up all these forces, usually any kind of rotation forces that occur, it falls on the premolar itself. So these are some of the examples of that, although this is a picture of a transposition of the canine and the premolar, but anyways. Uh, second is, this is a lateral cephalometric analysis and which is the percentage of magnification which is seen in this image. In this case, it is 7 to 12 percent. Now, uh, usually what happens is when you take a lateral cephalogram of a patient, there is some kind of image magnification happening. So, the least amount of magnification occurs in the midline and the maximum amount of magnification occurs in the structure that is away from the midline. So, uh, the axial tooth inclination and the dental alveolar ridge relationships in the midline of the jaws, here is where mainly the magnification occurs. Fourth one is which of the following face types is associated with mouth breathing? The answer is dolicocephalic. Now, dolicocephalic means a little longer face. So, what happens is in longer face syndrome, there are these typical characteristic adenoid faces in which the, there is a flaccid upper lip and there is a constricted upper arch and also marginal gingivitis is seen. These patients also suffer with mouth breathing and therefore incompetent lips among other features seen in a long face patient. Which of the following orthognathic technique can be used to treat class 3 malocclusion? The answer is D that is A and B, Lefort 1 osteotomy for the maxilla and BSSO for the mandible. So uh, this kind of a uh, orthognathic surgery can be done in patients who have a maxillary setback as well as a mandibular protrusion. Not for all cases because there might be some cases in which maxillary setback is not happening. It's only a mandibular protrusion. So this is in particularly those kind of cases. Next to the center of rotation and infinity is seen in which of the following? The answer is D, translation. Now uh, this is a part of biomechanics. When we talk about center of rotation, center of resistance, when the uh, translatory movement is seen, that means that the tooth is moving bodily from one position to another position. It is not just tipping in which the crown and root are moving in opposite direction, it is a bodily movement. Hence, the line passing through the center of rotation and through the center of resistance is such that these two lines are parallel and that can only happen when they meet at infinity. Therefore, when we talk about translation as in bodily movement of teeth, the center of rotation and resistance meet at infinity. When we talk about control tipping or uncontrolled tipping, the center of rotation and the center of resistance are at different points such that when you put lines through them, they meet either at the root tip or the crown tip depending upon what kind of tipping happens. The lowest most anterior point on the alveolar bone in the midline between upper central incisors is called the supradentale. Now uh, these are different points on the lateral cephalogram. The first one is basion. Basion is the median point on the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. It is more appreciated when you see uh, an anterior posterior view or anterior posterior radiograph or even if you see a skull from the behind, when you see the lower margin of the foramen magnum the median point of that is the basion. The Bolton's point is the highest point on the post, post condylar notch of the occipital bone. Uh, that is not very well uh, appreciated in this lateral cephalogram because that is a point which has to be made in the lateral cephalogram. It is not a normal anatomic point. Uh, the third one is misspelled is actually porion. Porion is the highest bony point on the upper margin of the external artery meatus. It is one of the very important points through which a lot of reference lines can be made for cephalometric analysis. Uh, again, gonion, menton, prostheon, these are points on the 
alveolar bone. Gonion is a point on the junction of the ramal plane and the mandibular plane. Again, this is a constructed point. It is not an anatomical point. The menton is the most inferior midline point on the mandibular symphysis. This is an anatomic point. And the prostheon is the lowest and most anterior point on the alveolar bone in the midline between the upper central incisors. This is a yet again another anatomic point. Uh, which of the following cephalometric points can be altered by orthodontic tooth movement? The answer is point A. Now that happens why? Because as you see, a point, the point A is the deepest point on the curve between the, just in front of the roots of the central incisors. So once the tooth moves, there is some amount of bone remodeling also happening. Therefore, this point A is dependent on the position of the central incisors. So once after orthodontic tooth, uh, tooth movement or orthodontic treatment is completed, the point A 100% usually changes. Now, which cephalometric point represents the central center of the ramus of the mandible? The answer is A. Now, uh, X, this is called XI point. You can also call it as XI point, however you would like it. This point is a constructed point. We have to construct it using four planes, uh, one on the lower border of the uh, margin, anterior and posterior borders and the ramal plane. Where all these four borders, they come together into section in the middle of the ramus, that is the XI point. Now, this is usually used in the little more complicated cephalometric analysis. Uh, next is, which of the following is the simplest type of tooth movement? The answer is C. Now, uh, tipping tooth movement is the simplest because not only can it be done by a fixed appliance, it can also be done by a removal appliance. In fact, removal appliances mainly uh, have their action by tipping. Translation is a very difficult movement which is usually done in a fixed appliance. Uh, torquing again needs a fixed appliance and control tipping is another part of tipping. Next is the sensitive 4 ounce dontry gauge used to determine force applied. Uh, by which of the following methods? The answer is an elastic. Now, the dontrix gauge is a gauge which is used to uh, determine the amount of force that is applied either within the mouth of the patient or any kind of orthodontic appliance. So, what you do is one end you can um, engage it to the particular appliance that you want and then you apply an elastic and you stretch it. So, according to the amount of force that is applied, that force is seen on the measurements on the dontrix gauge and it is measured in ounces. So, uh, the minimum that measurement that you can see here is around 4 ounces. So, this kind of gauge is used to measure uh, coil springs or elastics, intraoral elastics that is uh, used mainly, it started with the Beck technique. Next is, which of the following can be used for determining skeletal maturity of an individual? The answer is all. There are hand wrist radiographs, there are uh, cervical vertebrae radiographs and also tooth left abdomen. Now, uh, we cannot say that there is only one particular method which is foolproof or which is completely reliable. So, but nowadays uh, cervical vertebrae is usually mainly used routinely. The rest can be used as accessory methods. So, these are the different ways in which you can assess uh, the developmental age based on the kind of method that you would like. Next one is which of the following malocclusion is characterized by friends of the low end sizes behind the upper, I think centrals is the word. The answer is uh, class 2 division 2 malocclusion. Now basically this kind of malocclusion is characterized by deeply locked in lower central incisors. There is almost a close bite or a very very deep bite. So, it kind of what happens is the maxilla locks in the mandible, therefore it inhibits the further growth of the mandible. That is why there is a characteristic typical class 2 kind of mandibular growth that is seen in this kind of case. Next is in case uh, there is an edge relationship, the question is a little wrong. Uh, there is an edge to edge relationship in which of the following? The answer is C, that is middle third of the root. This, this I could not understand. There is something wrong with the question. And <laughs> okay. Uh, 
uh, a developing malocclusion can be intercepted and prevented best at which age group? The answer is C, that is 7 to 10 years. Now, why usually? Because uh, the centrals have erupted, laterals have erupted, canines are about to erupt and premolars are just about reaching the stage where you can see them coming into the oral cavity. Now, here uh, there are a lot of kind of interceptive orthodontics that also can be used. So, it is uh, best to start treatment at this age, but the formal kind of uh, full-fledged orthodontic fixed treatment can only be done at around 12 to 13 years once all the teeth have erupted. But interceptional orthodontics can be done at this stage. Flush terminal plane deciduous teeth uh, is expected to cause which of the following relationships in a permanent dentition? The answer is class 1. As you can see, flush terminal plane means that the distal end of both the cusps when you draw a straight line, straight line, they both meet. Now, what happens because of the transition period happening in the mixed dentition that the deciduous teeth shed and the permanent teeth start erupting, there is some amount of movement happening and usually a flush terminal plane most of the times leads to a class 1 relationship. Whereas a distal step leads to class 2, major step leads to class 3, so on and so forth, something like that. Uh, early mesial shift occurs by utilization of which of the following? The answer is primate space. Now, primate spaces are mainly found between the lateral and the canine in the deciduous dentition. So, when as you see this flush terminal plane, there are two possibilities. Either you get an end to end relationship or you get a class 1. Now, end on relationship is usually not very stable. So, what happens is it does not really stay at this position for a very long time. Maybe for a slight amount of time it can stay over there, but ultimately it either goes to a more stable position that is a class 1. The same way, mesial step either leads to a class 1 or it leads to a class 3. But in both cases, either class 1 or class 3 both are stable. Only the end to end relationship is not a very stable relationship. So, that is something which we do not usually see very common. All of the following part of the mandible shows endochondral growth except the symphysal region. Now, in the symphysal region, there is <clears throat> in the cranial base you see synchondrosis and the nasal septum coronal, uh, and condylar processes you see intramembranous development and the rest of the <clears throat> whereas the cranial vault and maxilla and rest of the mandible you see sutural growth development. Uh, second tooth resorption due to undermining resorption starts after 7 to 14 days. Now, undermining resorption mainly occurs when there is a very heavy amount of orthodontic uh, tooth movement or very heavy forces are supplied over a very short period of time. There is too much of pressure on the periodontal ligament. There is in fact almost uh, some kind of necrosis happening because there is uh, pressure on the blood vessels. The uh, the fluids ooze out of the blood vessels and hence this kind of undermining resorption occurs. Now, this is a not, this is not a very um, desirable thing that we need in orthodontic movement because it leads to unnecessarily mobility of the teeth. So, that is why we say that during a fixed orthodontic treatment, the force that is applied to the tooth should be the optimal force that is required for the tooth and not such that causes undermining tooth resorption. Uh, can you tell me when should I stop or because I can go on like this. Uh, area of hyalinization is seen in which of the following? The answer is an undermined absorption. Because of the histological appearance as a cell disappear, when you see an area of hyalinization, it is slightly bluish in appearance and this avascular area in the pedial is referred to as a hyalinized area. The best point to register the template over the patient cephalogram for tracing growth in cases with difference in cranial base length is nasion. Now, nasion is one of the most uh, stable points in a cephalogram because uh, very little amount of change as far as resorption or remodeling occurs in that place. So, when you take a cephalogram over different periods of time, let us say a difference of 1 year, 2 years, 3 years, 5 years. It is one of the registration points where you can place superimposed couple of cephalograms and see the changes that have been happening in other points. For example, previously we talked about point A. 
and the resorption uh, happening in point A and the change in position of point A. So, if you want to change, see a change in one point, you have to take one reference point, keep that as stable and see the changes occurring in the other points which can be changed. So, nasion is one of those points which are most stable in the skull. So, uh, the cranial base superimposition, it allows the relationship of the maxilla and the mandible to be evaluated. So, in general, the most useful approach is the SN line registering over the template. So, when you take the SN line passing through the cella and the nasion, that reference line is the most stable and among that, the nasion is the most stable. Why? Because another thing is that the cella also might undergo a couple of changes. Compared to that, the nasion is a little more stable point. While superimposing cephalograms, uh, which of the following is superimposed first? The answer is the cranial base. Now again, for the same reasons that the cranial base line goes through two points, which are the most uh, or rather the least changing, that is one of the reasons why we take the reference point as the basal plane, so that uh, changes in the lateral cephalogram over a period of time or because of treatment can be visualized much better and more accurately also. According to Ackerman Prophet's classification, malocclusion, which of the following is considered the transverse deviation of occlusion? It is called cross bite. Now, when you take an anterior posterior plane, it is like this. When you take a horizontal plane, it is like this. And this is the transverse plane. So, the answer is cross bite. All of the following are the median cephalometric points except porion. Median again is in the midline. So, cella is in the midline when you see it anterior posteriorly. Uh, ANS again is the midline. Porion is also not exactly in the midline. So, that is why the answer is the porion. Increase in length of the orthodontic wire causes all the following except decrease springiness of the wire. Usually, uh, we do not see an increase in length of the orthodontic wire as such, but when you put it in a patient's mouth and because of the temperature of the mouth, a little bit of flexibility occurs and because of that, the springiness increases. So, increase in length causes anything except decrease of springiness of the wire. The increase in length of the wire causes increases of range in action, decrease stiffness and reduce of the force applied. Which of the following is the most common form of malocclusion? Uh, usually you see class A, now uh, class 1. Now in class 1 itself, there are various, there are many variations of class 1. You can have class 1 with biomaxillary protrusion, you can have class 1 with spacing, class 1 with crowding. Therefore, class 1 is the most widely seen uh, malocclusion in any kind of a population. Oxygen tension alteration in PDL cells occurs after application of light pressure just in a matter of minutes. So, this kind of change that occurs when the moment you put an orthodontic wire usually occurs in minutes. So, <clears throat> the light pressure means that when you apply for, when you apply a force, it is either in a couple of seconds and heavy pressure causes changes even in less than a second or so. Can I stop now? Is this all right or should I catch? Ten minutes more? Okay. Protraction face mask derives anchorage from which of the following regions? It is a facial bone. Now here this is a reverse pull face mask. This is mainly used in a class 3 patient with a maxillary setback and a mandibular protrusion. So what you do is it gains anchorage from the forehead region that is here and a chin cup which is here. There is uh, elastics which are attached to the uh, a hook which is placed in the premolar canine region and these are attached to the main frame. So what happens is these elastics make the maxilla grow forward outward and there is a reciprocal push on the mandible inside because of the chin cap region over here. This is a form of an extraoral anchorage which is taken from the forehead and also from the chin. Heterogeneous population shows incidence of malocclusion as compared to homogeneous population. 
a heterogeneous population will show a higher incidence of malocclusion compared to homogeneous population again why because when you take people uh, belonging to different races cultures areas countries ethnicities religion they are going to have their particular type of malocclusion so when inbreeding occurs between different sects of people you will see a completely different malocclusion occurring in the offspring or in the next generation as compared to when you take people of the same culture and community inbreeding with them themselves the same kind of malocclusion will be seen passing on to the next generation there will not be much of a change because the genetic pool is decreasing further and further if you take a heterogeneous population you will see a mixture of genetic uh, codes and genetic populations and pools happening all over from different different areas so you might actually come up with a completely different uh, pattern of a malocclusion in the offspring so you will actually see a high incidence of malocclusion occurring in heterogeneous populations growth of maxilla first is completed in which of the following planes the first is width and then after that is depth and then finally height maxillary midline diastema is more than a uh, so and so millimeter rarely closes spontaneously that is 4 millimeters usually 1 or 2 millimeters is something which uh, can be seen either day to day wise and it might happen because of uh, many reasons like a very low frenal attachment or something like that and uh, sometimes just removal of the frenum as in phrenectomy can also spontaneously close the diastema but something more than 4 millimeters or 5 millimeters would need some kind of orthodontic correction the normal value of y axis in cephalometric analysis is 60 degrees uh this does not show the y axis actually the y axis is also called called the growth axis when you uh, want to figure out the growth pattern of an individual you draw the y axis depending upon the angle the y axis makes you can uh, figure out whether this person is a uh, has a is a vertical grower or a horizontal grower that also determines the kind of a facial pattern of the patient which of the following is the most important preventive and interceptive orthodontic procedure it is restoring deciduous teeth now uh, preventive and interceptive orthodontic procedures are um, they have very little bit of difference we do a preventive orthodontic procedure before the actual malocclusion actually develops so preventive orthodontics is mainly done in the deciduous dentition therefore restoring deciduous teeth if you restore deciduous teeth like suppose there is a very badly decayed uh, molar or something like that if we restore it then there are chances that the other teeth will not drift into that position hence malocclusion will not occur hence the arch width might not decrease those kind of things when we talk about interceptive orthodontic procedures that means some part of the malocclusion or problem has already set in we are trying to stop it at that position so that it doesn't become worse interceptive orthodontics includes serial extraction whereas preventive orthodontics includes restore, uh, restoring dentistry a pontic type of space maintainer can be classified as which of the following types it is functional why because a non functional one usually would not use a crown it would just be a band and a loop when you talk about functional it means it gives function to the arch so when you put a crown that means that you are replacing the tooth with a normal almost anatomical tooth structure so the function of chewing mastication talking etc those things are restored to normal so that is why one with the crown is used uh, is called a functional space maintainer hyperactive mentalis activity is characteristic feature of which of the following types of uh, malocclusion it is class 2 division 2 again previously what we had discussed in class 2 division 2 the lower incisors are completely locked under the upper incisors there is almost a complete or a close bite because of which the mentalis muscle activity is extremely high <clears throat> according to andrew six keys of normal occlusion which of the following is advisable for ideal occlusion the first the answer is gingival part of the long axis must be distal to the occlusal part 
now this uh, diagram is exactly not explaining uh, this kind of a key but when you take the long axis of the crown and when you take the gingival part that is the highest point that should be distal that means that it means that the tooth is not exactly straight in the jaw it is slightly curved there is slight amount of inclination and um, angulation that is present in each and every tooth and it varies according to the position of the tooth or the type of tooth that is present so you will not see a tooth standing absolutely straight like this there is an amount of inclination that occurs in each and every tooth which of the following is the best representative natural orientation of the skull the answer is the fh plane now the fh plane is called the frankfurt horizontal it passes through the porion and the orbital in this part now uh, this is the best representative natural orientation of the skull why because when you ask a person to stand straight and look straight this frankfurt horizontal is parallel to the floor so this is the most natural position in which you can orient a person without having to physically alter the position of the head even when you take a lateral cephalogram in a uh, in your radiology area or when you're taking it this is the plane that is most acceptable because the rest of the planes it is difficult to get so without actually tracing or having any kind of points or any kind of landmarks or guidelines we can obtain this position very easily on a patient just by standing and looking straight Baker's anchorage is an example of which of the following the answer is intermaxillary anchorage now intramaxillary means within the maxilla that means within the arch intermaxillary means between two arches so in this case this is the example of a class 3 elastic it uses a reciprocal force that means it is pulling one arch and it is pushing the other arch so this kind of reciprocal anchorage is called baker's anchorage maximum anchorage cases allow how much of space loss that is less than 1/4 that means almost 25% when we talk about um, anchorage there is minimum moderate and maximum anchorage cases now anchorage means what we are trying to anchor is nothing but something which we hold on to so that uh, suppose we are swimming in a pool or in a sea you see these little little anchors in between so the anchors help or rather stop us from drifting to a unnecessary position the same way molars are the anchor teeth so they stop the rest of the teeth to drift into a position where they're not supposed to so when you do an extraction suppose we remove the first premolars we like to bring the anterior teeth behind so we use the molars as a an anchorage so that the anterior teeth don't start moving in front or in any other direction so when you have a maximum anchorage case that means you want maximum amount of anchorage and minimum amount of unnecessary tooth movement that is called a maximum anchorage case so space loss that means unnecessary loss of space which we do not require should be minimum which is less than 1/4 or less than 25% in case of single rooted teeth the central resistance is located at which of the following locations It is located at the junction of the cervical and middle one third. In multi-rooted teeth, it is in a different position. Generally, the center of resistance is constant. It is the center of rotation that changes. In a single root, it lies between the first, the cervical one third to half of the root, apical to the alveolar crest. While in multi-rooted teeth, the center of resistance lies between uh, the roots, one to two mm, apical to the furcation area. the longer the root the more apical the center of resistance is that means more towards the root tip and the higher the alveolar crest the more coronal the center of resistance prolonged retention is required in all of the following cases except blocked out canines in a midline diastema it is almost always 100% necessary because of the fibers the gingival fibers that are present they tend to again you know increase the space and pull back the teeth class 2 division cases and deep bite cases almost for the same reason but in blocked out canines usually once the canines come down to the normal positions the incidence or the percentage of relapse is almost very negligible so in these kind of cases prolonged retention is not really required the amount of incisal liability in the maxillary arch is 7 mm 
Now, incisor liability is nothing but the extra space that is the difference between the space occupied by the incisors, the primary dentition and the permanent dentition. Since the permanent incisors are much larger than the dextrose incisors, when they, the dextrose incisors shed and the permanent incisors erupt, this amount of extra space is called the liability and it is about 7 millimeters in the maxillary arch and 5 millimeters in the mandibular arch. Spaces existing between dextrose teeth are called developmental spaces. Primate and simian spaces are nothing but the same. Developmental spaces are usually present in all children. In case developmental spaces are not present in a particular child, one must think that in future this child, the possibility of this child having malocclusion is going to be very high because these spaces usually help the child's permanent dentition to settle in a correct position and if these spaces are not present, usually there is a arch form tooth material discrepancy. Functional shift of mandible due to eruption of the permanent teeth causes deviation in which of the following directions that is transverse dimension and anterior posterior dimension. <clears throat> because uh, especially when there is an impacted tooth and that does not erupt properly, there is some amount of mesial movement or mesial tilting of the sixes and the sevens. Therefore, the, the shift of the mandible that is in the transverse direction occurs. Anterior posteriorly also because this again leads to some amount of crowding of the anterior teeth that happens. Sucking habit tends to produce constriction in which of the following regions of the dentition. It is uh, not only in the maxillary canine region but basically in the entire anterior maxillary region. Why? Because when sucking happens especially when it is a part of a habit in older children also. The thumb, the base of the thumb is placed right behind the upper central incisors. So, you tend to push the anterior maxillary region forward and it creates a kind of a V shape for the arch. So, instead of the arch becoming U shape, it becomes V shape because this there is a constant force being applied to the upper central incisors. Apart from that, there is also open bite because of uh, the complete tongue thrust and also the kind of uh, thumb sucking habit. You might also find a unilateral or sometimes a bilateral cross bite also. Threshold force duration in humans for tooth movement is 6 hours. Uh, because usually this is the minimum amount of time that is required for the force to be applied on the tooth and finally the tooth to start moving. Again, undermining resorption causes tooth movement in about 7 to 14 days after the force is applied. Next is 100% chances of successful opening of the palatal sutures are seen until the age of 15 because usually after that age there is ossification and if you want to do any kind of splitting of the palatal sutures either by rapid expansion or any other kind of expansion, it usually does not happen. There is no skeletal expansion after that age. There is usually just dentoalveolar expansion. Time required for bony uh, filling of the sutures after rapid palatal expansion is around 3 months. Now this is something which is important. Why? Because when we place a rapid palatal expander like the hyrax which is shown over here, the hyrax itself will take around a week or two for the uh, initiation and the activation. The activation schedule should be completed by two weeks. But if we immediately remove the hyrax during this period, the whole arch is going to collapse because when the new bone is getting made, it is still very soft and pliable. We need time for the bone to ossify and mineralize and become hard and then we are able to remove the hyrax so that that uh, expansion that is happening because of the hyrax will stay in position. In case rapid palatal expansion, uh, both maxilla rotates around the point located around the frontozygomatic suture. <clears throat> because these are the sutures which are most close to the area of expansion and uh, usually that is maximum amount of mobility takes place in these kind of sutures apart from the mid palatal sutures. So, you will see mainly movement occurring along these two sutures that is the mid palatal and the frontozygomatic. 
can i can this be the last one uh, function appliances are the example of which of the following answer is b again it's an interceptive procedure this function appliances uh, the word function appliances means it alters the function or it makes the function better that means function in the sense chewing mastication talking etc so again before a full fledged malocclusion has developed in a particular patient we can use these kind of things so as to restore the function uh, in such a way that uh, something like a fixed orthodontic treatment might not have to be used in future that's it